Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you all for coming to our lecture uh, of a Symposium of Aristotelian Studies. As some of you are well aware, I am Professor Daniel Simona Cimento, the organizer of the symposium and the host for this meeting. As usual, I'd like to thank FAPEG and CAPES for, this, for the financial support they've given us. And I would like to thank, to thank the research groups Pragma, Ozia, and Polyphonia for their academic support. Today, we're joined here by Professor Marta Jimenez and Andrew Co Colbreth, who will be delivering our lecture. And to debate uh, the lecture, we have Professor Lucas Agione, Roberto Grasso, and Breno Zopolini, which are, as you know, well, well, two of basic crew here. So uh, without any further delay, let me thank you all for coming for one more session. Andrew, Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming and showing up. Um, the paper we're going to present is a paper that is, uh, is still in flux and is work in progress. It's a paper that um, we are writing for a volume on uh, personal and epistemic transformation in the history of philosophy. And uh, we are in charge of uh, presenting what would be an Aristotelian model or like what, what we find in Aristotle as a, of a version of uh, how personal and epistemic transformation uh, occurs. So for that reason, we're going to start with uh, kind of like at the frame of uh, the question and uh, just setting up uh, the discussion with um, the most prominent version of uh, um, personal epistemic transformation that is on the debates today. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to move on to just find or propose what uh, we think would be uh, the Aristotelian alternative. Um, so Andrew, is going to start uh, with the discussion of the of the of the framework of the problem and uh, the presentation of the contemporary view. Go ahead, Andrew. Thanks, Marta. Uh, so, as Marta mentioned, this is just uh, sort of setting up, I guess, the issue that we're interested in, uh, which we call becoming someone new. So, we're trying to figure out. Um, what the role of experience is or might be in the sort of epistemic and personal transformations that contemporary authors have called transformative experience. If you could uh, select slide two, please. So um, there's been a lot of work in recent years on the notion of a transformative experience, which is this epistemic and personal transformation that makes you into a new sort of person. Uh, and the most influential account is that of L.A. Paul, um, so that's what we're gonna spend some time examining at the beginning of this to sort of explain uh, what a personal transformation is, how contemporary authors are thinking about it. Uh, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the talk, uh, as Marta mentioned, trying to understand sort of the metaphysical and psychological processes that underlie personal transformation. And we're gonna try to explain what Aristotle would have to say about this. Um, so in short, in, in Aristotle's view, experience is going to play an important role, maybe even a necessary role uh, in transformation, but it's not the whole story. It's not what does the transformative work by itself. Despite the fact that in Aristotle, we acquire dispositions through practice, uh, through engaging in the relevant activities, and in a sense, through having the relevant experiences, the Aristotelian picture of the process of becoming someone new is more complex and the transformative work is done by the, the confluence and interaction of nature, habit, teaching, and learning, uh, learning after other models of those around us. Um, so we want to explain what does the transformative work for Aristotle and to kind of get us into, to get us into that model, um, we can look at some examples of personal transformations that appear in the literature today. So uh, these are a series of examples that other philosophers have spent time writing about over the past few years. Um, so some are taken from L.A. Paul, some from um, Barnes and Callard's recent work, and then some obviously come from Aristotle. So think about the process of becoming a parent, the process of becoming somebody who really loves dogs. Maybe you adopt a dog from a shelter and you suddenly become a person who is obsessed with taking care of dogs. Think about processes uh, like um, acquiring a new sense mode of sensation. So there are examples of people who have uh, congenital um, blindness and through an operation, they acquire the sense of vision. And then you can think about more fantastic examples. This is one from Paul becoming a vampire. 
And then more Aristotelian examples, becoming somebody who loves music or becoming a musical person, becoming a virtuous person or becoming wise. Um, so all of these examples are situations in which somebody is transforming, not just in terms of gaining new knowledge or new experience, but perhaps also in terms of changing their preferences, changing their self-conception, changing their way of living in the world. So those are sort of, that's sort of the phenomenon we're interested in. Um, <clears throat> these are all big life changes. And there's different ways in which we can think about them. So we've kind of divided the, uh, the view of L.A. Paul, which is the most influential contemporary view of transformative experience. We've tried to uh, piece together different things she said and group them under one heading, which we call the replacement model. That's what I'm going to explain right now. What's this idea of personal transformation uh, that, we, that we have people writing about today? And then we're going to compare that with what we call the completion model. And that's going to be the Aristotelian picture of epistemic and personal transformation. So on the replacement model of personal transformation, and I'm going to talk more about this, um, the, the idea is that a new self comes into being and this new self replaces your old self. So somehow you go through a transformative experience and the, pers the self you have on the other side of that experience is radically different and new and is replacing the self you were before that experience. These sorts of experiences are often passive. They're like sense impressions is often how we think about them. Uh, it's something that happens to us. So think about acquiring a new sense, um, hearing a new instrument for the first time, seeing a new color for the first time, something like that. These are all, these are experiences from which you learn, but you're not so much actively involved in them. They sort of happen to you. On the replacement model of personal transformation, uh, there's sort of a psychological and epistemic discontinuity between our past selves and our future selves. Um, and in the replacement model, it's impossible for us to imagine what our future self will be like. It's almost as if there's a wall that separates who we are before the transformative experience from who we are after the transformative experience. And you cannot see over that wall you cannot imagine what your future self will be like. Um, finally, uh, it's the agent's pre-transformative condition. It, that's almost irrelevant to how the transformation is supposed to work. So to use some examples I'm gonna talk about, um, becoming a parent, it doesn't really matter what's happened to you before. For philosophers like L.A. Paul, you're faced with a decision, a choice to either become a parent or not become a parent. Um, and depending on how you choose, that will transform you in a new way. And there's no precondition to the choice that's informing your decision. There's no precondition uh, to yourself that's sort of making you receptive to that experience. Okay, that's the replacement model of epistemic and personal transformation. I'm gonna spend some time explaining that briefly, and then we're gonna compare that with what we call the completion model, which is the Aristotelian picture. But just to really quickly explain that, and Marta will talk a lot more about this, later on in the presentation. Um, we, we take the word completion from uh, physics 7.3, where Aristotle thinks about uh, the development of a virtue as a, as a process not of alteration, but as a process of completion or teleosis. Um, so Aristotle is giving us a picture of personal transformation according to which we are sort of involved actively in a process of learning by doing, we're practicing, and we're bringing into being certain kinds of dispositions and states. Uh, and this is a completion of kind of capacities that are in the learner and being activated through the learner's process of, of practicing and, and habituating. Uh, on the completion model, this picture that Aristotle gives us, as opposed to the replacement model, there's epistemic and psychological continuity between the learner and the expert, between who we are before uh, the process of habituation, through the process of habituation, and who we are after the process of habituation. Um, in the completion model on this Aristotelian picture, the present self can indeed anticipate the experiences of the future self. And the reason that's the case depends on Aristotle's metaphysical picture of uh, habituation and growth as a continual process of development. Um, 
And the agent's condition sort of facilitates and prepares them for the kinds of experiences that inform their process of development. So there are certain preconditions, certain uh, capacities that a learner will have that they're activating and developing that are going to lead to the completion and development of certain states. And then finally, on the Aristotelian picture, this is a slow, gradual process. All right, so to summarize what we think the, the Aristotelian picture of personal development is, um, we're gonna focus on his concept of the acquisition of a hexis. <clears throat> this is going to happen in different contexts, and he talks about it in different places, but we're gonna look at comments he makes in the scientific treatises and in the ethical treatises, and we're going to try to reconstruct a useful model of personal and epistemic transformation. So for Aristotle, acquiring a hexis is a process in which there's a genuine epistemic and personal transformation. It's a big life change of the kind we, uh, of, of the sort of examples we saw earlier. Um, and so the virtuous person is going to be significantly different from the not yet virtuous person. Um, and yet the agent is acquiring a new perspective. They're acquiring new preferences, perhaps even a new self-conception. But on the Aristotelian model, this is not one of replacement. It's not like a future self is coming to replace a past self. Uh, and it's not a process of qualitative change, but instead this is a process of becoming oneself. In other words, it's a process of developing into one's nature, of growing into one's nature. So the Aristotelian picture is grounded in a metaphysical account of a teleological process of learning. Uh, and this account allows for psychological continuity between the epistemic and motivational uh, structure of the learner and the epistemic and motivational states of the expert or virtuous person. <clears throat> okay. So to, um, and oh, and the final thing is that the learner is going to be prepared in a certain way for the experience to contribute to personal change. So it's not like the uh, transformation of a learner for Aristotle happens ex nihilo, it's rather prepared by uh, activities, capacities, dispositions of, that they have prior to the process of transformation and that are informing the process of transformation. So I wanna briefly talk about the uh, replacement model of transformative experience. <clears throat> I'm gonna quickly move through uh, some of the literature, but mostly focus on the work of L.A. Paul. Um, I'm gonna lay out what that picture looks like, and that will sort of set up the Aristotelian account as a contrast. So according to Paul, uh, she, she offers this helpful distinction between two ways in which an experience can be transformative. Experiences can either be epistemically transformative. Uh, by that, we mean they give you radically new what it's like information or new phenomenal information that you do not have prior to undergoing the experience. So an example of an epistemically transformative experience might be uh, tasting a new fruit for the first time or tasting a new food for the first time a new flavor that you've never had a taste of before. That gives you new phenomenal information, new what it's like information, and you cannot acquire that except by going through the process of tasting that food for the first time. She distinguishes that from what she calls a personally transformative experience. And this is an experience that changes your preferences, your priorities, and your self-conception. An example of that might be starting a new career an alternative example could be somebody who adopts a dog for the first time and then suddenly starts to love everything about dogs and then become a dog person or something like that. So these are all uh, ways in which you would be personally changed through the process of transformation. Now, Paul calls transformative experiences, those experiences that are both epistemically and personally transformative. All right, so you need both aspects in order for the uh, process to be a transformative experience. It has to give you new what it's like information, and it has to change your preferences. And those are deeply connected to each other because you cannot get the information of what it's like to have the experience except by going through it. And thus, your preferences will not change until you know what it's like to have that experience. 
So an example that Paul gives in her, her book from 2014 on, on transformative experience is a kind of uh, example drawn from fantasy, but it's one that she, she, it's a guiding example for her throughout the work. And it's the process of becoming a vampire. So you can imagine somebody who has a choice about whether or not they want to become a vampire. This person is very different from who they're going to be on the other side of that transformation. Before they become a vampire, they do not know what it's like to be a vampire. And before they become a vampire, they do not have the preferences and the kind of self-conception they'll have after becoming a vampire. So needless to say, if one becomes a vampire, you're going to have very different preferences and a very different relationship to sunlight, to blood, to all of these other sorts of things. So that's the kind of picture of a transformative experience that's guiding Paul. And the main point is that uh, these transformative experiences teach us things that we cannot know except by undergoing the experience. And in the process, they change your subjective point of view. They change your preferences. But we can move away from uh, the fantastic example of a vampire and look at a more um, real example of becoming a parent, which is another example that Paul uh, frequently discusses. <clears throat> so, uh, so Paul argues that becoming a parent is not any different than becoming a vampire with respect to its transformativeness. So obviously very different in other respects, but uh, with respect to the fact that this is a transformative experience, because you stand in the same relationship to becoming a parent as you do to becoming a vampire. You, Paul claims you do not know what it's like to be a parent prior to becoming a parent. And you do not know uh, whether you will like being a parent prior to becoming a parent. So the self you are prior to going through that transformation lacks the, the epistemic information you have on the other side of becoming a parent. And it lacks the preferences you might have on the other side of becoming a parent. As Paul writes, forming a loving parent-child attachment relation is the source of the foundational shift that parents experience with respect to what matters most to them. Many parents shed their old selves and create new ones forged by the deep and powerful love they feel for their baby. The shift involves a core value change. What's important here though is that we do not know what our future self will be like when we're making a choice to become a parent. And Paul notices that this fact, if she's right about transformative experiences, she notices that this presents a serious problem for standard models of decision theory. Typically, when we're making a big life altering decision, perhaps the decision to become a parent, the decision to start a new career, in those sorts of situations, we typically would want to imagine what our future self will be like. We want to imagine what the outcome of our choice will be like in order to make an informed decision. But what Paul is suggesting is that it is impossible for us to make an informed decision because we do not know what it's like to be a parent except by undergoing the experience of first becoming a parent. And we do not know whether we will like being a parent except by first undergoing the experience of being a parent. So. It seems we cannot make an informed decision about these big life altering transformative tr decisions, these big transformative changes, um, precisely because we stand on the other side of that choice and who we are after that choice will be radically different. Um, and you might argue, we can talk more about this in Q and A. One might argue that you could talk to other people about what it's like to be a parent. You could come up with other information about what parenthood is like, you might babysit or take care of your nephew or niece. And all of those might be ways of trying to uh, figure out what being a parent is like. Maybe that's a way of trying to access what it's like to be a parent. And Paul argues that this sort of sidesteps the problem because the issue isn't what other people say about parenthood or whether they value it. The issue is whether you will value it. And you do not know whether or not you'll value being a parent except by becoming one. And you do, not, you do not know what it's like to be a parent, except by becoming one. So third personal testimony isn't really going to help you out here. It's not going to help you make that decision. And that's why these sorts of transformative experiences prevent, pr present such a significant problem for decision theory. Uh, to, 
provide another quote from Paul. She writes, if a personally transformative experience is a radically new experience for you, it means that important features of your future self, the self that results from the personal transformation, are epistemically inaccessible to your current inexperienced self. And that's what generates the whole problem for decision theory. Okay, next slide, please. Great. So um, <clears throat> we're not gonna talk so much about the problem for decision theory. We are more interested in the metaphysical and psychological processes that underlie epistemic and personal transformation. So um, we could talk more about the problems for decision theory in Q&A, but the rest of the talk, we're really trying to understand what is the metaphysical picture or the psychological account that underscores uh, this idea of a transformative experience. And Paul says at least three things that are really suggestive to quickly go through them. First, she says that the transformative experience presents something like an epistemic wall. So she uses the metaphor of a blank concrete wall to describe what it's like to face a transformative choice. Prior to the transformative experience, you have no idea what your future self will be like. You don't know what it's like to have the experience. And it is impossible for you to imagine or project into the future and try to anticipate what that future experience is like. <clears throat> Secondly, so this is the uh, next slide. Uh, she claims that there's something like a replacement of a future self and a past self. So <clears throat> when you go through a transformative experience, some future version of you, some future self is going to replace the past version of you, the past self. And that future self, she says, is psychologically incommensurable with your past self. Why? Because the future self has already gone through some sort of experience that has transformed its what, uh, its knowledge of what it's like to be in that position, and it's gained new preferences, new, new priorities, perhaps even a new self-conception. Uh, so who you are before and who you are afterwards are radically different. Um, Paul does note that this is not so much a problem for the metaphysics of personal identity, or at least it's not a problem for what philosophers have traditionally dealt with under the heading of the metaphysics of personal identity. Rather, she prefers to talk about selves. So I might be causally related to my future self insofar as I made a choice to transform. However, this, this, psychologically speaking, I am incommensurable with my future self. There is a radical break in discontinuity between my past self and my future self. And that leads us to uh, the final point that we wanna emphasize on this replacement model, this contemporary picture of personal and epistemic transformation there is a radical discontinuity between past and future self. So the, as Paul says, the question she's raising is whether it is possible to assess the rationality of this choice, given that this choice straddles two discontinuous personalities with two different rationality bases. And the two personalities here are your self prior to transformation and the self that will come about after the transformation. So to summarize really briefly, and then uh, we can talk a lot more about Aristotle. Um, the replacement model is one according to which there's a break between your past self and future self, discontinuity in the process, uh, and there's kind of an epistemic wall where you cannot anticipate and imagine what your future self will be like prior to transforming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, um, it is exciting now to just uh, try to um, have a exercise a, an alternative model or present what would be what we think would be the uh, Aristotelian alternative model. And it is lucky that we were invited to present this in this workshop. But there are uh, so many people who have been thinking about uh, 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 the metaphysics of uh, acquiring a hexes and uh, and. Um, and uh, questions about uh, development in general. So, uh, what we're going to, what I'm going to do now is uh, present some of the moments in Aristotle that I think that uh, indicate a big departure from the model uh, in that, that we've seen in in Paul and uh, and uh, and the reasons why Aristotle uh, in Aristotle that the, the experiences, despite the fact that they play an important role, uh, do not have that kind of like a, a radical uh, 
break uh, character that we find in Paul. So um, one of the first difficulties in starting to think about this, and it is a big challenge to just like go back to Aristotle, like what would Aristotle say to Paul? And what kind of alternative would, she, would he give? Uh, one of the difficulties is that uh, the examples from an Aristotelian point of view seem to be all over the place because Aristotle makes a number of distinctions so that uh, things like becoming a vampire can never be analog, in so far this just like becoming a different species, uh, can never be analogous to what it is to just like uh, become a parent that it seems to be just like a, most like a, acquiring a hexes or becoming virtuous or learning something. And uh, at the same time though, it is interesting that some of the examples are, uh, uh, some of the examples are, are, are continuous. So for example, Paul and um, in the literature in general, there is a, a lot of discussion in the lines and these lines about uh, acquiring a new mode of sensation, like acquiring sight or, or things like that, that Aristotle also uses in his own discussions uh, as a contrast to uh, the model of acquiring a hexes. So, um, in that kind of like a messy sea of uh, uh, examples that are just uh, intersecting, but are not, not not directly speaking to one another, and uh, and uh, distinctions that are uh, different. Um, uh, we've come up with this uh, completion model for Aristotle, and like uh, we want to underscore that uh, some of the features of uh, when we think about. Um, main kind of well, the first decision is that that, that we've made is just like to focus on the acquiring a hexes as the main model of a, a personal and epistemic transformation in Aristotle and um, and then when we focus on the process of acquiring a hexes uh, we see that uh, the model is not one of replacement as we have seen in the in the in the contemporary model, model of Paul, but rather one of uh, completion, and uh, that has uh, consequences in terms of uh, uh, what the relationship between past and future selves is going to be, and uh, also about the the role of the present self in the transformation and in the recept in the reception of the of the experience. So. Um, just to use a, a terminology that Kaller uh, uses in, a, in one of her responses to, to Paul, um, while in the in Paul's model, experiences are like revelations that have like, transform one this, like, and something that happens to us. In the in the Aristotelian model, they are um, transformations are always uh, processes in which the agent is actively engaged and comes with a. Uh, um, like the, the, the conditions with which the, the agent comes and engages in the activities and receives the experience is going to be determinant on uh, what the effect, what effect the experience has in the agent. Um, so, in light of those uh, early considerations, uh, we come up with this completion model where. First, it is important that Aristotle talks about completion and he makes a big deal about how a grana hexes is a completion and not an alteration. Um, second, uh, it is a process in which the agent is actively engaged and uh, he very often talks about, uh, at least in the context of acquiring a virtue, but also in the context of acquiring, um, of acquiring technai and, uh, and other kinds of hexes. Um, he talks about uh, learning by doing, and uh, and uh, he establishes a big contrast between that and uh, and uh, the process of uh, just like simply uh, activating one's sight or one's hearing, for example. Um, and uh, when he talks about uh, uh, these processes of uh, acquiring a, a, a hexes, um, he establishes that there is a continuity or his style. This is uh, this is maybe the most controversial move. Uh, but um, but uh, we think that uh, in Aristotle, there is, despite the fact that the learner and the final result, the, the, the person with the fully acquired hexes, um, is going to be they are going to be different in many respects, and uh, and uh, their kind of epistemic situation is going to be different in many respects. Nonetheless, there is a continuity between the learner. And uh, the and the person who has acquired the the, the hexes that um, is expressed in different ways, so that uh, the activities of the learner are continuous with the activities that uh, uh, come out of uh, um, the agent who already has acquired the 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 disposition, the hexes, and also importantly for the contrast with that Paul's um, model. 
um, in Aristotle, uh, the learner is able to anticipate in relevant ways the experience of uh, the future self. So the present self that is making the decision of engaging in, in um, activities or experiences that are transformative um, is not completely psychologically or epistemically uh, 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 separated, or there's no wall between them, but rather there is a there is some kind of like a continuity between them. So, on the other hand, one of the reasons why for Aristotle in, in the Aristotelian context is not possible to talk about um, this model of experiences as revelations, as things that happen to us, um, is. Uh, uh, or like uh, things that that, that that things that that can happen um, that 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 can happen to anyone in a way, and that that they are transformative for everybody um, is um, the the fact that uh, the learner uh, needs to be in a certain condition in order to be receptive to the experiences or to the activities and do them in the right way. So um, uh, these. Um, uh, is acknowledging them in a, in a set of the lit contemporary literature, the discussion about uh, 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 transformative experiences and uh, and uh, some of the commentators uh, on, or some of the uh, participants in the discussion have raised questions about like how um, the, the, the transformative char character of an experience is uh, contingent and that it, like it, the, the same experience is not transformative for everybody. So like a, being a parent or like a, a getting a dog is not going to have the same uh, transformative uh, effect in, in people. And there's like Aristotle has a better story, I think, or like a good story, um, an alternative story for why uh, there is um, there is that contingency of, uh, of the effects of the transformative experience. So it, in the end, what well, we get, and then uh, the mod we don't we don't get to characterize the whole model of transformation in Aristotle, but uh, we want to emphasize that uh, um, the picture that he presents is a model that has a complexity because there is a confluence of many different factors, and uh, it is gradual, and it's not just like a, a one experience. Uh, despite the fact that occasions like doing something one time can just uh, can just transform someone nonetheless like uh, the characterization that Aristotle gives is the one of a process that is gradual and it has multiple sources that prepare the agent to uh, um, to to transform so I'm gonna go through these points uh, relatively quickly because I want to leave time for discussion and uh, I want to start with the first point about how um, one of the main things that Aristotle one of the one of the first um, uh, things that we wanted to emphasize in Aristotle's model is that he takes a kind of hexes uh, or like hexes as um, not an alteration but a perfection or a completion he distinguishes he, he establishes this distinction uh, that you're familiar with between uh, completion and uh, or, or realization of um, one's nature and the acquisition of a new quality and uh, both in the physics and in the the anima he emphasizes the fact that uh, um, acquiring a hexes it falls under the falls under the the label of um, of um, of uh, acquiring a perfection or or a complete or perfecting oneself or or completing oneself um so um through both in this passage from physics 73 um where he uses as a um one of the models of uh, acquiring a, a hex is a, acquiring a virtue and uh, he here says that um, excellence is a kind of perfection or completion. The word is tel teleiosis. Um, so when something has acquired its own excellence, then it is called perfect. And uh, and uh, it is uh, most in accordance with its own nature. So um, the process then is not one in which uh, the is not one in which uh, the the agent um, kind of like a ch the, the agent changes in a way that departs from the person who he was or who she was, uh, but rather one in which like the agent comes to be uh, most um, according to their own nature. Um, 
And uh, in as you're familiar with, we have a, a similar move, although this is a Aristotle is a is a little bit uh, slippery when he when he um, makes this point about how the, the acquisition of hexes are are, are not um, alterations but uh, completions, and uh, in the, the anima uh, to 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 five passage, uh, he he says um, he he presented in similar terms. I think that what we find in the in the um, uh, physics seven three passage, uh, but there um, he he opens the possibility of it being kind of a special kind of alteration. So if it is an alteration, it will be a special kind of alter alteration, and it is a special kind of alter alteration that is going to be one of uh, uh, coming to uh, one's nature. So um, here. Because these passages, I think that they are familiar to the uh, the people in the public. I'm going to, I'm going to um, maybe um, not say um, much about it, except for the fact that uh, um, this has to be understood in the general context of uh, Aristotle's uh, metaphysical um, Aristotle's metaphysical framework of. Um, um, the relationship between potentiality and actuality, and uh, and uh, that is something that uh, allows him to kind of like a, give a give a different account for the kinds of changes that occur when someone develops or maturates, even um, um, develops or maturates. And uh, like, what is interesting is that the acquisition of a hexes that falls under that. That category. What is interesting for our purposes. Um, so here, I gotta move quicker. So I'm going to go to the slide next. Um, the second point that we wanted to emphasize is how personal transformation is a, an active process, and this is something that I'm kind of a um, that I've that I've said a lot about in the past, and uh, and that. Uh, um, and that I think that is pertinent in order to you know, like, uh, emphasize uh, the, the peculiarities of the Aristotelian model here. Um, um, in, in the Nicomachean ethics and uh, also in the metaphysics, Aristotle talks about uh, these um, uh, not capacities, but uh, um, uh, these positions, the states that uh, we need to first exercise uh, in order to have. So he contrasts them with uh, the senses and uh, that we do have by nature and uh, we don't need to exercise in order to in order to use them. And uh, he distinguishes the senses from excellences in general uh, that uh, we need to first exercise uh, before uh, we, we have them. Um, and uh, this famous passage from Nicomachean Ethics to One, where he talks about how we we get excellences first by exercising them, and that happens similarly in the arts. Uh, and uh, the term there is uh, energesantes, so it is like something like an activation. And uh, the idea is that uh, by performing certain actions, we do get to um, activate um, uh, some capacities that we already have. Uh, but uh, but we do need that practice in order to in order to have them um, properly. So similarly, the passage from uh, metaphysics uh, nine five he uses this term that is that the pro energesantes. So he talks about how we acquire some of the. Some of the capacities or some of the dispositions uh, by uh, previous exercise. So the idea is similar that as opposed to the senses uh, that, that come just by nature, other things like uh, playing the flute or learning or acquiring a technical expertise um, um, are acquired through pre activation. 
Um, and that indicates that there is already something in us that the exercise brings out. So there is not something like a becoming someone fully new that has nothing to do with the present self, but rather uh, um, this, so to speak, the seeds of uh, the future self are already in the in the in the present self. Um, so, and uh, because of that model. I think, we think that uh, the, there is a continuity between the before and after self in personal transformation. And uh, this continuity um, is also expressed in the way in which he talks about how we acquire these dispositions. And uh, so in several passages in the Nicomachean Ethics and the Diodemian Ethics, when he talks about acquiring a virtue, he talks about how uh, it is through doing that we become, like we acquire the capacity, the, the, the disposition to act in a certain way. It is through doing those activities and doing them well. Um, and uh, he establishes, he emphasizes the fact that there is a similarity between the activities before um, we acquire the disposition and the activities that emanate from the disposition. So that uh, there is a continu there is a similarity between the activities and the similarity. Um, we take it to be um, significant in the sense that uh, the kind of like the movements that the soul goes through are going to be similar. And that includes uh, uh, questions about our relation to pleasure and pain, uh, which is going to be relevant insofar as uh, like the idea is that like, like the underlying movements are going to be, are going to be similar. There is of course going to be, um, uh, a difference between the learner and the person with the hexes, mainly that the, the, the person with the fully formed hexes um, has uh, is completed and the learner is in the process of getting there. Um, and uh, nonetheless, the activities that produce the hexes need to be significantly similar to that. And there is that continuity. Um, so, um, and uh, another consequence of uh, this uh, continuity is going to be that um, the learner is going to be able to anticipate the experience um, in the transformation. So as opposed to the replacement model where uh, there is this wall between um, the present self and the future self, and that the, the, it is impossible to anticipate what it is like, and and uh, in, in many ways, in the Aristotelian framework, um, there are um, indications of the fact that uh, the experience of those who are on their way of of, of, the, of transforming, those are on their way of acquiring a hexes, do have access on the one hand to um, the um, future pleasures, and on the other hand, uh, to the future perspectives of uh, those who are uh, acquiring, of those who have acquired the, the, the hexes already. So one indication of these, and this might be overstretching the passage, and I want to know what people think about this. In Physics 7.3, when he talks about the acquisition of hexes as a, um, not an alteration, but the result of an alteration, he says that um, um, these states, they are completions, they are the teleoses, and that uh, they are not alterations, but they uh, come to be when the sensitive part is altered. And, uh, and the sensitive part is altered by sensitive things. I'm reading the passage. For all the ethical virtues are connected with bodily pleasures and pains. And this occurs either in action or in memory or in anticipation. And um, I wanted to make a big deal about the fact that he includes anticipation there, as in there is the possibility for someone who is uh, um, acquiring a hexes and doesn't have it yet uh, to be able to kind of like anticipate the uh, future pleasures um, that uh, um, are not necessarily um, that that are um, not necessarily uh, grounded on memory, but rather there is an anticipation and an ability to adopt the perspective of the person um, of the person with the fully full form hexes. So. Some indications about the possibility of uh, um, 
So maybe this is kind of a summary of the view. When the activities are performed well, the learner is able to experience the proper pleasures of the exercise of a hexes, even before having the fully formed hexes. Um, Aristotle here talks sometimes about uh, the learners being able to taste the pleasures. So he talks about how those who do not make progress in, in the acquisition of virtue, for example, are those who have not tasted the pleasures of the noble. And uh, there is some kind of like a necessity of the learner having tasted the pleasures of the noble in order to be able to engage with the activities properly. Um, and similarly, and this is something that uh, um, uh, we also find in other discussions about moral development, the learner is going to be able to adopt the perspective of the virtuous person before having a fully formed hexes. So some of the texts that support these claims are about experiencing the pleasure of an activity before having the corresponding hexes. We do have in Nicomachean Ethics 10.5 uh, this claim about uh, how um, the, um, uh, those who enjoy geometrical thinking can become geometers and grasp the propositions better. Those who are fond of music or of building and so make progress in the function uh, by enjoying it. And I take this as an indication of the fact that the learners are able to enjoy the proper pleasures of the activity. And uh, enjoying the proper pleasures of the activity is in a way uh, kind of like a, having a access to what it is like to have the disposition. So this is kind of like a, a the continuation or an elaboration of what Aristotle means when he says that we um, that that it is a, that it is through inner gain, like through through a, activation that uh, we get to have uh, that we get to acquire the hexes. Um, and uh, um, the other aspect that uh, falls into this category is uh, the possibility of adopting the perspective of a virtuous person before being virtuous. And uh, these, uh, both Mariska Loinison and um, Margaret Hampson have uh, talked about in their discussions on moral development, uh, the idea that uh, um, in the processes of imitation that are central to moral development, the children are encouraged to re-invoke uh, the perceptions of the actual goals presented to them uh, by imagination. So imagination plays an important role in the process of imitation so that they can take pleasure in the performance of the good actions and that they do in a way that is kind of like adopting the perspective of the virtuous person already. And uh, this is something that has been developed in Margaret Habs's paper in 2000, of 2019 about uh, um, imitating virtue, where uh, she argues that uh, it is uh, the emulative imitation of the agent that uh, involves the adoption of the agent's perspective of the of the of the agent's perspective of the virtuous agent's perspective. So, in imitating the virtuous agent, she says the moral learner not only attempts to act as the virtuous person does but uh, to see the world um, as if through, their, uh, through her eyes. And, uh, and that she offers arguments for how, like in the, in the, in the Nicomachean Ethics, we have tools in order to, uh, in the discussion of emulation specifically, tools to like, substantiate the claim that uh, it is available, the perspective of the virtuous person is available uh, to the learner. So, um, that's uh, about point four. And uh, one other thing that uh, I wanted to add, and I know I see now that I'm over time. So it is um, this point about how the learner has to be somehow prepared for receiving the transformative experience in a particular way. And this has to do with uh, the debate about the priority, priority of the condition over um, the priority of the agent's condition over the possibility of feeling the pleasure. Um, so this this comment or this kind of like line of uh, this feature of the of the Aristotelian model is relevant because it helps to explain, as I was saying, I was I was saying at the beginning, the fact that um, uh, transformative experience seems to have a contingent character, um, and. Uh, it, 
and uh, it doesn't offer the same kind of processes, the same experience as being exposed to similar things like becoming a parent or getting a dog, um, are going to um, have different effects in different people, are going to be transformative for some and not transformative for others. And I think that in Aristotle, the we would have an explanation for that, that is that the learners have to be prepared or in order to be receptive. Um, and the process of preparation is one that is, uh, um, uh, lovers have to be prepared. Let me just like uh, make that point quickly. This has to do with uh, uh, how for Aristotle, there is this uh, priority between, priority of um, love over, over pleasure, over pleasure, the idea that it is, uh, that people find pleasant that's of that those things of which they are lovers and he uses the example similar to barnes example about the dog lover he uses the example of the horse lover and um, the idea is that uh, horses are pleasant pleasant to those uh, uh, who love horses and uh, um far from being a strategy like a be question begging a strategy it is like what the point that aristotle is making here is um that uh, learners have to have at least some receptivity to the kind of like a, the, the, the pleasures of engaging with uh, the object in order to in order to be able to perceive um it's their the their in, in order to perceive those pleasures um so here again as i was saying this has to do with um the debate about the priority of uh, um, the relationship between conditions and the ability to enjoy pleasures or the ability to do uh, them to do the activities properly before having the before having the hexes and uh, there is a debate between uh, Bernard and Sarah Brody, Miles Bernie and Sarah Brody and John Cooper goes back to there uh, where. Um, uh, Bernier seems to be proposing a model in which uh, learners do have access to the pleasures in an anticipated way that both um, Sarah Brody and Cooper are resisting. And um, I have suggested in the past a solution to that debate or like, a, like what I think is Bernier's solution that is that the learners do not have, to have um, um, kind of partial access and it's occasional and it is, it is uh, not necessarily the same as and yet it is something that is continuous with the kind of pleasures and the kinds of perspectives that uh, that the possessors of a hexes have so the claim is that uh, learners are not there yet and they do not have the full perspective of the virtuous person or the person with the hexes however they do have something of and they're not blank slate so that they have something of those that capacity to um, receive those pleasures and the capacity to engage with those activities properly that uh, is all they need in order to get the process started um so just uh, to wrap up um um one of the things that uh we want to say just at the end is that that that, that, that there is the Aristotelian model, like trying to figure out the Aristotelian response to this challenge about uh, what a transform transformative experience does, um, leads to this like a impression that for Aristotle, the process is one that is seems to be way more complex than the the kind of like the streamlined examples that we find in the contemporary literature often, and that uh, it is one that is. Um, is a is a is a is a process that is gradual and it requires a multi-source preparation. So, just maybe just to give a, um, in support of that, um, we do have uh, on the one hand the fact that uh, in the in the physics, for example, Aristotle talks about uh, underlying alterations that occur in the process as something that is going to fa facilitate the transformation. Um, um, and uh, examples of preparation appear in the discussion of uh, moral development in politics, seven and eight. So there, um, Aristotle talks about things like exposing newborns to 
like particular environments, diets and motions in order to build a certain way of being that is going to prepare them to be able to uh, receive uh, the disposition. And um, similarly, the process of moral education has this kind of preparatory uh, character where um, the learner is exposed to experiences and um, the learner is exposed to experiences and uh, and uh, sensations that are going to kind of like prepare them for um, prepare them for uh, being able to appreciate the relevant experiences in the right way. And finally, also the social component and uh, something that is also underlined in the discussion about emulation, the need of uh, this is like being able to just see other people engaging in those activities and uh, the ability to kind of identify the relevant features of the activities and also be able to emulate the relevant parts of it. Um, it is also um, uh, uh, the guidance of others and the comments that others make about uh, what it is like uh, once you acquire a hex as the expert or the virtuous person is going to be relevant for the learner to acquire the relevant perspective that is going to enable them to be receptive to the experience in the right way. So that ought to say that uh, that ought to say that the transformative experience on its own cannot do the experience on its own cannot do all the transformative work. And yet experience does experience does a lot of work. And when does the work is always because it has been prepared in these many other ways um, um, in the process of uh, habituation and uh, in the process of uh, of uh, becoming who we are. So um, I was going to say something kind of like a, the Aristotelian version of uh, becoming a parent, uh, but I'm just uh, going to maybe refer to um, Sophia Connell's beautiful paper about uh, about parenting in Aristotle, uh, where like one of her main points is that for Aristotle, in making the deliberate choice uh, to incorporate the extensive requirements of the young into the aims of one's life, people realize their own good. And uh, her paper um, was uh, it was a happy find in relation to this project because uh, um, one of the things that she's doing is illuminating in what way becoming a parent requires the confluence of all these factors and including the social factor and. Um, and uh, also is seen in the Aristotelian framework as something that is part of realizing one's own nature and realizing one's own good. That is a perspective that is different from the you know, making a choice uh, uh, independently of that. So um, I think I'm going to leave it there. And uh, maybe Andrew, you want to add something, a moral conclusion, but maybe we can just like, we, we can just like uh, maybe reiterate, summarize what we said, or just leave it there. I don't know. Daniel, what'd you say? Yeah, we're, we're short on time. Maybe uh, the conclusion by way of question and answer. But the, the basic point is, I, I think we've made clear that the conclusion is just to restate the distinction between the two models and explain for Aristotle that <clears throat> We're talking about acquiring hexase as a process of completion. So these are big life altering changes, but nonetheless, there's continuity and in the process, and there's an account of becoming someone new that is the uh, that is a way of developing dispositions on the basis of prior conditions. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Andrew and Martha, very much for your presentation. Uh, let me put everybody on the stream here. Um, uh, we, I have already asked uh, them if they have some questions. They all have some questions, and we have worked out uh, a little order here. So the first one is Roberto. Roberto, please, your question. So uh, first of all, thank you. It was a very interesting and refreshing uh, presentation because it's not very usual to have this comparison between contemporary debates and Aristotle. Uh, now, I don't know if I'm able to uh, ask my question in a clear way because I'm trying to combine two things in one. I don't know if I'll manage, but I'll try. Uh, what I'm trying to combine is an idea, a feeling that I have about a serious, maybe serious, maybe not, limitation in our attempts to 
ask Aristotle, what, what is his, what's your view about this contemporary debate? Uh, but uh, the main point, I, I guess, it's about anticipation. So when you were talking about, okay, in Aristotle there is this possibility of anticipation, I was thinking, now I'm very curious about where is it, where is it, like, what, what is the text where this happens, because I, I wasn't aware of it. And now ab about the passage in the physics, uh, my first reaction, I mean, I'm not studying that passage very deeply, but my first reaction would be that uh, there's nothing like a specific pleasure for uh, uh, this or that activity. And it seems to me, but I may, I may be very wrong, but it seems to me that for a student it's more like, for some people there is pleasure with this activity, for other people, there is the same pleasure, but it's just co-occurring with some other activity. And in this case, would be, I don't know if it's really telling us something relevant with regard to the question about the anticipation of a specific type of pleasure that you can only know after the first time that you have that kind of experience. Uh, it's Yeah, it seems to me that first order is just pleasure. And it's the same pleasure, it's just that for some people is while doing something, for other people is while doing something different. So if, if we have some evidence that can prove wrong this understanding that I'm having. With regard to the other passage, the one in the Nicomachean Ethics, there I see that it's a different type of pleasure because it's the pleasure of this taste for the noble action, for example, okay? and there I see that it's a completely different uh, type of pleasure and I see why Aristotle is, uh, is willing to stress that. So, but in that case, it seems to me that it runs against the idea that for Aristotle we can have anticipation because my understanding there is if you don't experience that type of pleasure, that very specific type of pleasure, so it's a pleasure that you can have even in a condition of distress, like imagine being courageous while feeling that fear on the battlefield, okay? It's a very specific type of pleasure because you can feel it while you have some kind of distress on the other hand. And the worry, I think, it seems to me that the Aristotle, Aristotle's worry there is you have to feel that pleasure very early or you have to know that pleasure in order to recognize that it's something that you may want to feel. And so, yeah, there is sometimes a very specific type of pleasure, but it seems to me that for Soto is rather an argument for against the possibility of anticipating that, that type of pleasure. Uh, you have to feel that kind of pleasure in order to desire it in the future. And yeah, this is basically my doubt and trying to squeeze in uh, the other concern that I had. It seems to me that there is only concerned about these things when there is some transformative experience that has some moral type of uh, uh, importance. So if you have a transformative experience that, that can give you some sort of essential level up or level down uh, with regard to your uh, moral uh, conditions, condition, then yes, it's interesting. It's a topic that we, we may want to talk about. But other types of transformative ex experiences that uh, I'm learning are debated uh, nowadays. It seems to me that for him are just accidental type of changes with no re really no nothing very uh, philosophically important there. And this was my word about the possibility of drawing this comparison uh, between the contemporary debate and Aristotle's possible position about it. So I don't know if it was clear, but this is what I'm... Yeah, it was very clear. Thank you for all those yeah. questions. They're great questions. And uh, I mean, I, I, I sympathize with you about uh, kind of like a, 
the squim, like the, the kind of like doubts about how to read uh, physics 7.3 in relation to like the pleasures of anticipation. But uh, I just like, I like the fact that he introduced that there because it, it, it felt like it was just like giving me a little bit more like a, of giving us a little bit more wiggle room to just like, even in the physics, he's talking about the pos this possibility. Now, the place where I see the discussion of this, that is uh, like not that minimal one-liner, but actually there is more to, to more meat to put your teeth on, is um, uh, Nicomachean Ethics 10.5, uh, where he makes this distinction. And I, I've written about this, so I, and, and both Lucas and Breno had heard me about this already, so I might just bore them a little bit. But um, um, that is uh, in in in, in Nicomachean Ethics and five. He makes this distinction between the proper pleasures and the alien pleasures, and he makes this big deal about how like pleasures are intrinsically bound up with the activities. So that uh, like that is this kind of like, the, the the pleasure is the pleasure is bound up with the performance of the activity in a way that you cannot. There are no free floating things. It's like the pleasure of playing the flute, it is like a bound up with the activity of playing the flute. The pleasure of doing noble actions, the pleasure of doing virtuous actions is bound up with the activity itself of doing virtuous actions. And then and he uses that in order to kind of like talk about how proper pleasures, those who belong to the activity, kind of like facilitate and encourage learners to keep doing it. And uh, uh, alien pleasures are the ones that kind of like distract them and get them away from doing that for performing the activities and there i see an indication of the fact that learners before having the disposition are going to have access to those proper pleasures of the activity and that is i think what we the all that we need in order to get a sense of the fact that the learners are able to glimpse on the other side of the walls so of the speak and they have access to what it is like to be a virtuous person what it is like to be a flute player so my child is learning to play the violin now, and I'm not sure that he has tasted the pleasures of violin playing yet. You know, so, so it's just like, and uh, I do think that unless he tastes them, he's not gonna make progress in playing the violin. You know, it's like, I'm using now this model that I kind of dislike highly of like offering a cookie at the end of violin playing. And it causes like, I, I, I cry. I, every time I had to do this because it goes contrary to my model of moral education and education in general, that is that rewards and punishments distract you from the activity itself. But it is in the hopes that he's going to have a glimpse eventually by playing the violin, he's going to have a glimpse of the characteristic and proper pleasures of violin playing. And of course, his pleasure is going to be very different than Paganini's pleasures. So like of playing the violin and yet, he might get a glimpse, he might get a taste of what it is. And uh, that is something that the replacement model doesn't allow, but that the Aristotelian model does allow. The fact that uh, by performing an activity that's characteristic of a, of a, of a, a hexes, we are kind of like a, exercising the hexes itself. It's not like, the, like we only can exercise the hexes once we have it fully, but we can exercise the hexes pre energy in the hexes, so to speak, in a way that uh, this pre energy is like at the full deal in a way, because you are able to uh, engage in the whole in the whole activity. Sorry, my battery is running low. This is not great. Um, okay. um, so that is, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy about that, about those passages because I think that they kind of like might satisfy your, your thirst for passages. Um, and then I do sympathize with the like, uneasiness about the examples. And like, like that is, this is the first reaction that we had when we were trying to figure out how to respond to the, more, the contemporary conversation about transformative experience. That is, uh, it feels like the examples are all over the place in relation to Aristotle. And yet we need to have to just like be able to clean it up from the Aristotelian perspective. Like, like that's not like cleaning up from the absolute point, but like how does this, ex what, which examples fall under the category of transform relevant transformative experience and uh, and which ones fall under this completion model? And it, it, Aristotle will have something very different to say about becoming a vampire. And as you said, like uh, you, Roberto, are not interested in becoming a vampire. Like. Uh, Paul also just like makes the joke, just like this is a silly example. Like I'm like, I hope that it doesn't turn you off. Uh, so like there is an awareness of the fact that those examples are not like typical human experiences or positions that we're put into. And yet, like those are things that also like uh, 
we might be able to be able to explain from the Aristotelian point of view. And those are going to be uh, uh, more on the side of uh, kind of like what Aristotle would call alteration. So I do think that becoming a vampire, for example, would be a kind of alteration and not a completion. And then like uh, what Aristotle would say about acquiring a new mode of sensation, uh, if it is a new one that it is not like a, for a blind person to become to acquire vision but it is like for us to just like have access to a sixth dimension that might be a case of alteration too probably from the Aristotelian perspective now if it is for a for a blind person to acquire vision that might be a case of completion I mean it might I, it might be a case of completion I don't know what to say now that is different from, and I thought that we thought that the cases that were clear were the ones about, were the ones about acquiring a hexes, because not even just moral hexes, but also intellectual hexes, and uh, kind of like a technical hexes, like uh, playing the flute, or um, even like things like becoming a parent, that in the Sophia Cornell paper, it becomes very evident that it's kind of like a way of, uh, it's not like a necessary feature, essential feature of our of, of, of human nature. And yet it is a way of completing one's nature and can be characterized as such and allows us to exercise some of our natural capacities for friendship or capacities for um, uh, benefacting others, et cetera, that uh, we already have the seeds of. So I think that like the line that you're, like, I wouldn't draw the line in moral or no moral implication, no moral implication, but rather on, is this something that we can characterize somehow as belonging to, or like being a development of our nature? And things like becoming a parent or things like a, a playing the flute or becoming a music lover, I think that they are. And those are the examples that I think that we can kind of like, discuss from the Aristotelian point of view it under the label of acquiring a hexes. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it will be a long discussion, but I, if there is time, I will ask you some something more about it. But for now, I'm uh, happy. And thank you again for the for the presentation. Thanks. Now, it's Breno. Breno, your question? Thank you, Marta and Andrew, for this interesting presentation. I uh, was wondering about your view on uh, voluntary states or dispositions in Aristotle, because I I have this light impression that it could help uh, the view that you you are advancing uh, in at least one of the interpretations of voluntary states in Aristotle. So uh, there is a weak interpretation according to which a, a state is voluntary if the actions that give rise to the disposition are voluntary and the other is that there is a stronger inter interpretation according to which uh you know the for states to be voluntary the agent needs to have a sense of uh, i mean the principle of of the process of acquisition of that disposition must be internal to the agent. And also the agent needs to have a sort of knowledge of the, the characteristics of features of that future condition. Uh, so for instance, if I am drunk, I am responsible for my actions, not because the conditions for voluntary action are satisfied, but because I have acquired that disposition voluntarily because I, the the principle of the process through which I become drunk uh, is internal to me, and also the I have a, a sense of knowledge. I know the the eleven features of this experience of being uh, of being drunk, uh, and so in this stronger interpretation, it seems like it kind of helps your view, especially when it comes to the. The second and third aspects of the completion, sorry, the second and the fourth um, uh, aspects of the completion model in the sense that the agent um, sort of has a, an active role in the process towards the future condition. And also that he kind of needs to anticipate that future condition in a way 
in order to the process to be voluntary, right? So that sounds like a continuum to Aristotle's view on, on voluntary states as well. Uh, but again, uh, I think, and that relates to Roberto's questions um, as well. Uh, it that seems to apply to this. I mean, voluntary action or the acquisition of voluntary states are teleological process, and uh, the result is some, somehow anticipated by the by the agent or by the efficient uh, cause in general. Uh, so when Aristotle talks about transformative experiences in this sense, is uh, his notion doesn't cover all cases of trans transformative experiences for our contemporary. Uh, uh, scholars, I think, right, because there are there could be like accidental uh, transformations for them as well. So, in order to get a coherent picture, we need to sort of exclude those. But anyway, this was a sort of a common uh, a suggestion, and I'm interested in knowing whether it would how how is exactly your view on voluntary states, and do you think that that somehow helps? Uh, your your position. And did you want to talk? You look like you want to say something. Yeah. I, I think yeah, yes, it's extremely helpful. And I think like we want to take the strong interpretation. Um and it and it and it I think if we if we do adopt that perspective, it does it does provide more grist for our mill. Like it does allow us to understand <clears throat> how it is that the process of acquiring a voluntary state is sort of a teleological process. And it does it it has to involve these sorts of anticipations of the kinds of pleasures that are proper to the virtuous activity or the kind of knowledge that the virtuous person is activating when they're acting. Um, at least that's are we on the same page in that regard, Marta? Yeah. And then like part of it, I think that um one of the things that we wanted to get like introduce in the account somehow is the idea that uh, uh like like keep the partiality of it. So like the idea that the agents are co what Aristotle says in, in Nicomachea and Ethics 3 5, that agents are co-causes or like a like co like they are partially the, the, the acquiring the, the disposition is like partially a, 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 the result of the agent's choice. But 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 at the same time, like they are all and that's why like the, the final idea of the complexity, there are all these underlying features about like a, whether as a baby you were exposed to cold or not that are going to, for Aristotle, and this is very worrisome for anybody trying to bring up a child, is like a, all these things are gonna have an effect in like the the, the next selves that are going to like a, be able to make those choices. So there is like, a, we are called causes, because uh, because yes, like uh, th there is going to be these uh, like this active involvement and uh, active like taking control of the process in the in the having awareness of uh, having awareness of where we're going and having awareness of uh, um, of how it will look like in some way. But also there is a number of other causes that are going to just like have an influence in the, in how experiences look to us. So if we haven't had that preparation or if our society is corrupt or all these other things, there might be like external factors or other factors that are external, but not external because they become us right away. So the fact that I wasn't exposed to cold, exposed to cold is like a matter of like a, my, my trajectory and any way is embodied in my body it, so that uh, like it it habilitates or debilitates me to have experiences of a certain kind and that's why like this thing about like the preparation is important and that i'm um, in so far preparation is important and preparation is not always like chosen that way there is a partiality to the voluntariness of it i think that is interesting Thank yeah you. part of our part of our account is that relies on this notion of emulative imitation, but there's a question of how even emulative imitation gets off the ground in the first place. Like how is it that somebody starts not just mimicking the actions of a virtuous person, but adopts the perspective that they have. So acting according to some degree with the knowledge and motivations that the virtuous person has. And the answer I think is to say, just Martin, this is just dovetailing on what Marta just said, there has to be an involvement of a teacher, maybe a parent, somebody else, Who's sort of showing the person what the salient aspect of the situation is, showing them what's fine or noble about that action in a certain state, and that might get them off the ground in the first place. So you're not, so you're a co-cause in that sense. 
um, if that and in relation, to, yeah, and it's very interesting in relation to that. Elizabeth Barnes has a paper that is in response to Paul's book that uh, gives an example that is very interesting about um, about uh, becoming disabled and then learning to live as a disabled person. And uh, and uh, like the, the, there's some autobiographical reports about uh, how like some people this change their perspective about what it is to be disabled, for example, and that change of perspective kind of like informed their experience of the way in which they were embodying their own disability in a way that was empowering. But in order to go through that process, it wasn't just that they having the experience and then kind of like a coping with it, but rather having a society like a, like a social input on it and having other people that give us that framework is going to be very important in order for us to be able to kind of like see the experience in the relevant light okay Thanks. thank you um so i i would like to, to break the order for a quick follow-up just a question uh, to you guys that came to me uh, because of brenna's observation which is uh, I, through all your whole presentation, I, I kept thinking of uh, uh, the transformations as something positive. Up until Breno asked the question, uh, and, and then it, it dawned on me that, well, maybe that's not the case. You know, you, could, you can have a personal transformation for the worse, and still, you know, once you get there, you were like, oh my God, how did I become this person? And uh, I wonder if you, if you guys have something on that. And uh, one thing I would like to, to ask you is, when, when Brennan mentioned the, the voluntariness of character, uh, I understand there's a problem. I, I agree more or less with what he says, but to me, I think that the strongest, the strongest argument Aristotle has for the voluntariness of any character uh, is his argument from negligence, where basically what I, what I gather he's saying is this, maybe you didn't know you were going to become unjust when you started doing unjust actions. And you probably, I would say certainly, you did not want, you did not desire that as a result. Because that's something I take about Aristotle's uh, theory of virtual vice. I don't know if you agree with me, which is, uh, it is rational for anybody to take virtue as its own reward. Because, you know, people believe, the, the, the apostles of virtue, they, they believe that virtue is a nice thing to have. But you don't see anybody saying, you know what, you should steal, but not because of the money. You should steal to build unjust character in your soul. You don't see anybody saying that. You, you, you probably will see people saying, you know what, it's not a problem to steal, but they're doing it for the money and not for the character. Nobody wants vicious character, not even vic the, the, the vicious person. That's not what they do, what they do. So that's a, that's a, that's a problem there, I think, for Aristotle's account of the voluntariness of unjust character. Because it's not their goal when they when they when they go to the action, but you can get that through that through negligence, right? You wanted other things, you never give it much thought, and now you're unjust. Now it's not the same with being a parent. You can become a parent through negligence, but theoretically, you should be aware that you are going to become a parent before the child actually arrives, even if you were negligent. But with unjust character, with vicious character, maybe that is not so. Maybe the personal transformation happens. And there's one day when you just realize, okay, this is where I am. This is who I am. What do I do about it now? Now, in this case, I, I don't see any room for you anticipating pleasures or anything of the sort. And I wonder if, how, how, how you guys think about that. So um, this is one of my favorite passages in Aristotle, where in Nicomachean I think three five he says that only an idiot would not see that by doing, like by going to drunk parties you become a drunk, or by like a uh, uh, doing uh, greedy things you become greedy, or that by doing the uh, I don't know gluttony things you become a glutton. But it's like a, there is this like. He thinks that uh, the connection between activities and dispositions is common sense, and that like everybody is aware of that. So like he's he's kind of like the argument from negligence is really kind of like put uh, on on its like upside down by 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 that clan because he says well, negligence, negligence. Like these people were not maybe actively thinking I'm going to become unjust, and yet 
they cannot claim that they didn't know that by doing those actions they were going to become unjust. It's just that you they they, they neglected to have that thought present and they prefer to do the greedy thing or they prefer to cheat, etc. Now, um, and this is why it is important in the account of acquiring a hexes that it is by doing the relevant actions well that you acquire the hexes, and it is by doing the relevant actions wrong that we acquire the contrary. So you know, like you become a good flute player by playing the flute well, and you become a bad flute player by become by playing the flute badly. And uh, I mean, like, a, like anybody who has learned an instrument has heard this room, their music teachers, you know, if you keep repeating the thing done wrong, that doesn't count as practice because you're just practicing it wrong. So you're going to become a bad, like you're, you're not going to acquire the skill, you're just going to acquire the anti-skill, so to speak. And, uh, and, uh, and that is like with I think that that's a model for like a, a acquiring a, a, a hexes in general. And as you say, like there are some activities that promote the acquisition, and there are some activities that destroy it. Now, Aristotle says. This is something that we know, like we know it. Everybody knows that in order to become a good runner, you gotta run every day and you're gonna run well and faster every day. And if you run slower every day or you just like trip more and more, then you're not practicing the right thing. So like that idea that there's a connection between the activities and the how you do them with uh, the dispositions that are being formed. And uh, and uh, he, in the physics and uh, in the Nicomachean analysis, he doesn't talk so much about the destruction of these positions or like the generation of vice in general. But the idea is that it is through similar activities. It's through similar activities done badly that we become like the bad version of that. And that, that we destroy the disposition, so to speak. So like we do have the seeds for the disposition and then we do have to do the activities in order to develop it. And we need to develop, uh, do, do the activities well and now in order to do them well, we need to have certain preparation that enables us to kind of like a grasp the conditions of, uh, and that have the eye in the right thing, like a kind of like identify what the goal is properly. And, uh, and, um, and uh, if not, we are going to just, there's going to be the destruction of the, of the condition. So I do think that, uh, that in the Aristotelian picture, there is a space there's a space for an account of this kind of like a, the negative transformation. And it is like through doing the actions wrongly that you do have like the destruction the, the, or the deviation from, he talks about ecstasis, like he talks about deviating from the yeah. hexes. And, uh, and then that, that ecstasis of course, through doing the actions badly. And there's many features of what counts as a badly done action. And it is sometimes like, you know, like it doesn't sound right. You're playing the violin wrong and I can hear it. But other times, you can't, you know, like uh, it might be that they're playing the violin thinking about the cookie and they're not enjoying the pleasure of the violin. That also is a wrongly done activity and doesn't promote the disposition properly. Now, it might promote some kind of like parts of the disposition, like it might promote some parts of the skills or the capacities to play the violin so that the next time there's more possibilities for the learner to do the action in the proper way. However, it doesn't kind of like it has that kind of like direct route to the disposition that is to perform the action well. Um, so like, yeah, in that sense, that is, that is one of the reasons why I think that the richer Aristotelian version is, is useful in the sense that it is not just like being exposed to something that kind of like tests you how you would be. It's not just like by being exposed to a certain, Suddenly you hear Wagner. If you're not prepared to listen to Wagner, like it's not gonna do anything to you. I don't know why I said Wagner. Uh, uh, let's say Vivaldi, that is like a friendlier example. It's not gonna do anything to you. Um, but um, like with certain preparation and with certain kind of like orientation, it might have that transformative effect. And uh, that, like this, that, that story is also like it happens also for how we get to just like do the actions wrongly or have the experiences wrongly in a way that they do contribute to the to the transforming into the wrong person as you put it at the beginning does that does that answer your question yes i, I just got one small uh, doubt from what you said I, it was not clear to me when you read the negligence cause the, the whole the whole thing about being an idiot uh, do you do you take from that that he actually supposes that everybody knows it 
Because what I take from that is he believes a lot of people are idiots. That's what I take from myself. That that's you know like the, we have a lot of idiots here, you know, because he doesn't think moral development is something so common, so common, or at least to me, he doesn't seem to think. He thinks virtues is hard, virtue, virtue is hard, and he believes that people who, who have been uh, who have gone the other way, they they can't be, you know, brought back. So you know, when I read that negligence clause, uh, my my understanding is a lot of people do not make that connection. They are idiots, and they are blamed. They are. Uh, they, they can be blamed because the only thing that explains them not making the connection is negligence, because it is something that they could know because a lot of people know it, and they they ought to know, <laughs> but they don't. So in, that's the way I read. Wait, it. But, like, but that would make Aristotle yeah. very much like a Socratic, and I think that he wants to separate from that, so that uh, people can know it and then not use that knowledge. You know, so it's yeah. like a, in the in the, and and the, and that like they're not using, they're not using the knowledge in your activity is part of what it counts as like doing the activity wrong. So it's just like a, in order to do the activity right, you need to use this knowledge about the awareness of the connection between this activity and the disposition that it generates. Well, well since you mentioned use, one last, do you think that the problem with them is acrasia then? That's what uh, happens. I mean, like, I'm just like, a, um, the only account I mean, is like, yeah. on what it is yeah. like. I mean, like, I, and and this is, I think that this kind of deliver, like the answering, answering, or like trying to put this model together is very useful to just like connect these different parts of uh, what's going on in the ethics. I think because, uh, like, this question that you're asking, that you push pressing me, which is like, well, if they are not, the like, problem is that they're using, then they are credit. Well, I think that I think that uh, like probably that's the that's the, the category that they belong to, and then the explanation to for why they are acratic now becomes available in this account of the complexity because now we say oh so there's this a lot of factors that have failed for these people to be able to listen to that experience. I like to listen to the or to adopt that perspective. They cannot adopt the perspective because you know, kind of like uh, they, they, they they salivate too much, or like whenever they they they, they, they smell chocolate, or like there is a number of alterations that have happened underlined that have been the result of things that have happened to them, and also of kind of like activities that they have engaged in in the wrong way, and it has happened to them that they have had those experiences, and that kind of underlying condition makes it impossible for them to be able to kind of like activate that knowledge in the right moment. First, I thank you. Uh, now I'll, I'll speak no more. Lucas, it's your turn. I uh, thank you, Martha and Andrew, for, for this talk. I have uh, to start to uh, irrelevant remark maybe. So there is uh, in Aristotle maybe one example that uh, is more near to what would be a transformation like becoming a vampire, which is in, in physics 1.8, is uh, one, 100. I knew, I knew you would have this piece of information. Okay, 191b10. Uh, uh, actually, Ross has an addition in the text, but because he doesn't understand the, the text uh, correctly, in my, my view, what our author is suggesting is a transformation from being a horse to being a dog. Okay, it's not the same as becoming a vampire, but our author is at least flirting with this kind of fantastic example in which a, a given animal of a given species becomes uh, an animal of a different uh, kind. Well, this is just, just a remark. But then I, I have my question, which is uh, actually uh, maybe it's <clears throat> the same question as Roberto's and uh, something common with some overlap with Bruno's uh, thoughts as well, which is on about the pleasure, and especially specifically about the pleasure of the activity uh, being the same uh, become uh, sorry before and after uh, the agent has acquired the the hexes. Well, <clears throat> I, I want to be more clear clear on. What exactly is your view? Because it's, it seems to me that there are two options. One is to say that uh, you have exactly the same pleasure before and after, 
uh, but then you allow for there have been a variation of degree. So I'm thinking that you accept that um, we are in, we are authorized to say that the uh, the person who has the full hexes has the pleasure in with more intensity than than the learner. Maybe this is controversial, but I'm 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 assuming that you you accept that. So accepting this, uh, one option would be to say that yes, the pleasure is the same. There is variation in degree. Uh, the other option is to say that well, uh, there is some difference in the uh, learner's pleasure in, uh, for instance, uh, exercising the violin and uh, the pleasure of uh, Paganini <laughs> exercising of, of the violin. Uh, there is some difference, but the difference is, is not, so to speak, uh, is not jeopardizing some generic unity between those sorts of pleasures. So it is the, it is, uh, the same pleasure in a given way, but it is different, but the difference is not enough to say that uh, on a relevant aspect for the for explaining the learning, on the, that aspect, the pleasure is uh, the same, like uh, uh, gene, uh, generically the same or something like that. So this is this is my 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 more, more substantial question on on your view. But I have also some some small doubts about uh, going back to the replacement model. Is the point five in the replacement model? And I, I think it's sort of implausible. I, I understand that you present the model as a foil to Aristotle's conception, but I, w I want to, I want to uh, get more information about uh, what, how it is that poles make it plausible. The point five that is. The agents uh, pre -transform transformation conditions are uh, irrelevant. Um, how can they be so irrelevant? So I, I understand that. So in our Saltus model, we have a set of preconditions much more demanding, but um, uh, it doesn't seem very plausible to me to say that uh, any agent in any sort of precondition will do for for the transformations, some sort of miraculous transformation is going on, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, maybe they are saying something um, not so radical like, like this, maybe something more uh, compatible with our status model. I don't know. So just, I, I was wondering about that. So. so, I mean, just to go to go on that last point on the, the fifth component of the replacement model, um, it does seem like Paul and others do, will say something that extreme, that there are really no preconditions before you're making the choice. So another uh, writer, Olman Margalit, she has an example in, in one of her works where she considers the case of somebody who's choosing between becoming uh, an, a physicist, a nuclear physicist, or a concert piano player. So these are two possible career choices that both of which require years of preparation and training. Um, so that decision in real life doesn't seem like one that anyone would actually ever face because the amount of time it would take for you to prepare to become a nuclear physicist would preclude all the years it would have taken to become a master piano player. Um, and yet she's using this as a model for a transformative choice, either A or B. And the example does seem to be, at least to me, artificial in that way, or perhaps slightly implausible. But I think that shows us something significant about the difference between the contemporary accounts and Aristotle's account, because the development and change for Aristotle is always gonna, there, you've gone through years of developing by the time you have an option to become a nuclear physicist or to become a piano player, right? You've been practicing for years and years to get to that point. And I wonder, this goes back to Roberto's question, I wonder if, this is my own view, but like something has gone wrong in beginning with the example of the vampire. Uh, because we're talking there about like moving from being a human being and Aristotle would consider that change to be like a destruction of being a human being. And now it's something else entirely. Or, or, so um, if you then take that as your guiding model and look at all other transformations as these kind of breaks or ruptures, you already, it puts you in a position to then start entertaining options where there are no preconditions for the change. It's just, 
there's a break or some sort of radical discontinuity between the self before and after. And Aristotle just doesn't allow for that, it seems, because he's already thinking about development as a teleological process, at least in the cases that we're interested in. Um, so, and the problem would be the, um, the, the, the claim that the case about becoming a vampire is analogous to making the, deciding to become a vampire is analogous to deciding to become a parent in the relevant ways. So like I do, th like I, 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 I see Lucas worry and nobody states kind of like nobody has written in the paper the preconditions are irrelevant i think that is more like a, the fact that the precon like a, we are like noting that that the preconditions are not taken into account in the consider in in, in the description so like a, the, the 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 way in which that applies to the view is weaker in the sense that like nobody's committed like a like a fully committed with all the consequences to the claim in the sense that they've written it but then by making this analogy between becoming a vampire or becoming a flute player or becoming a dog lover or becoming a, 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 a parent, like the analogy between the exact, the fact that like, there is a similar structure to them, that claim is the one that kind of like leads to uh, uh, a lot of the characterizations to be such that it seems that the preconditions are not relevant. So that is kind of like our like a reading of the of the of the model as one that doesn't pay attention to or or, but it's not that they claim that the preconditions are irrelevant. So like a Lucas like a Lucas worry, I think that gets a little swayed by, by by the fact that there is not an active claim, um, and yet there is a, there is sufficient of a there is sufficient of a suggestion of the claim by the, by the way in which the examples are being made, made par parallel i think that one person that is worried about this is uh, agnes callard and so like that example that andrew mentions is one that she that she mentions in her response to in her response to uh, um uh paul and uh and she herself is worried about the fact that there is no prehistory of uh of the choosing between this and that and uh, and that is kind of like one of the places that made us think that uh that uh that, that made us confirm the fact that uh like this thinking about the preconditions is important and that would be a, a the emphasis on that in the Aristotelian picture is a virtue of the model There okay. might be there might be other situations. I'm wondering too if his examples of becoming a god, you know, like you wouldn't wish for your friend to become a god, things like that in the Nick and McKeon ethics could also be these kind of fantastic in that way. I don't know, it'd be interesting to think about you're not being human anymore, you're becoming something else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That example is one that uh that uh, uh, uh like it would be we haven't thought about whether there is like the way in which I sort of drops it doesn't look like a, he's like presenting it in the pro, in the model of like becoming a god or god wouldn't be it, it seems like a, a kind of a revelation transformation of the kind that Paul talks about as opposed to what it would be some kind of like acquiring a hexes the hexes would be like the hexes of divinity <laughs> I don't know what kind of hexes but it is it, it doesn't seem that it would fit with his model of like that kind of transformation um yeah so in response to your question about the pleasure, uh, I agree that it that I agree that we are a little kind of like a hand wavy about it and we don't like make explicit in what way the pleasure is the same. Um, now um, we just say things like the pleasant the pleasure is relevantly the same and um, I don't even know whether we can say that the difference is one of intensity. So like it might be that it has, I mean, I can't imagine that the learner that for the first play, time plays something well, is going to feel a pleasure with an intensity of the roof. You know, it's like, a, yeah, like I remember doing something well for the first time. It was like being just like, this is amazing. I, I, I got it. And that kind of like a, that kind of like a, the intensity of that pleasure. And, and yet, um, and yet there has to like I, I like we're kind of committed to like saying something like there is a difference in degree like it's like it has to be a difference in degree and not in, in kind um so like i i don't i don't see like in the two options that you give both of them seem to be like the difference is not in kind um and the first one is like same kind but difference in degree and the second one 
I uh, I didn't understand in what way they were not the same because if they if the difference is not in, if if they they are generically the same then like what is the difference if it is not in degree? Well, it's uh, take by analogy the case in which we say that uh, cats are different from from dogs. So in one way they are animals and they are quadrupeds, mammals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a lot of aspects under which they can be uh, taken as the same sort of animal but they are different different species that that was the theoretical yeah. framework I, I had in mind in, in the <laughs> second, second option yeah. yeah it could be the case it could be the case too that there's another difference between learners and uh, the virtue the virtuous person in that the learner may have let's say that they have a kind of pleasure that's the same in kind as the pleasure that the virtuous person has in doing a virtuous action. Maybe it's different in degree, but in addition, the learner might also take pleasure in other things that are not necessarily the noble action or something like that. So there's an inconsistency in their Simultaneously ability. or, yeah. Say again? Like they, they, pleasure, they take pleasure in other things, either simultaneously or just like a kind of like a, they shift attention. Uh, yeah, sporadically, like, like, yeah. exactly, yeah. And as they become virtuous, they're, they become more focused in what they're able to take pleasure in, something like that. They don't have conflicting desires anymore, perhaps. They don't sometimes take pleasure in doing the noble thing and not, um, yeah. That can be another, another source of difference. I think, I think we wanna say that it, they're the same in kind. So the kind of pleasure that the learner has, if they're developing well, is the same kind of pleasure, the same kind of pleasure as the pleasure of the virtuous person, but perhaps different in degree, and additionally, the learner sometimes takes pleasure in doing the virtuous action, sometimes not. But as they become virtuous, they then only, right, they take pleasure always in the right thing. And they're not, uh, their attention is not focused on any other sources, uh, competing motivations, competing uh, objects of choice. Yeah, so then the answer to Lucas's question, it would be just like, it is the same in the first way that you were saying it is the same. And it is the same because it is kind of like a someone with the seeds for that disposition is exercising that disposition. And insofar, what the activity is, is an exercise of that disposition, is an actualization of that disposition. The pleasure is the same. But then it might be flakier in the sense that the, the, the learner can just like suddenly get distracted more easily by something else or that uh, it's not the level of reliability is less so that yes. uh, it depends on whether they're tired it depends on whether they they're, the plans that they have it depends on like whether they had a good breakfast or not that it's going to make a difference in the way in which they engage with the activity that is different from the person who does have the activity already and kind of like it's just like a sorry. It has the the the, the hexes already, and uh, in a way, it's just like kind of like a, it, it, it flows from it in a reliable way. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one another aspect I was going to ask you. So that the person with full hexes, uh, in a way, uh, she has the pleasure because in delivering a good performance, uh, she knows that she's capable of doing that. She relies on herself. She, she knows that, well, I'm doing this well and I can repeat it because I'm good at doing it. This is the sort of thing that the learners couldn't uh, tell for him for herself. So uh, even if the learner delivers a specific uh, good performance, but just one performance, he, he or she doesn't have yet the, the, the uh, this sort of, uh, let's say this, yeah, this sort of um, picture about uh, her own uh, uh, reliability, as you have said, and uh, its ability to repeat the same performance. Uh, that's really, that, yeah, yeah, that's really that's great, nice. uh, Lucas. And that kind of like a, that, that 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 matches with uh, this thing that I'm obsessed with. That is the role that the kind of like the perspective of others have in in uh, in. Uh, in in our and our adopting the right perspective in relation to the the the, the activities. So like uh, uh, as you know, the shame issue. You know, like, so like the, the fact that we have to rely on the on the on the views of the others. We have to rely on the observations of others about our own goodness in order to appreciate our own goodness because we are not there yet 
to kind of like a fully appreciate it. And yet we do have something of it. And like there's something of it that it, it, it works in two ways. There's something of it that allows us to occasionally enjoy the activity itself, but also there's something of it that allows us to look to the relevant people in order to kind of like get a sense of whether what we're doing is in lines with the activity that we are aiming at or the with the with the hexes that we are aiming at uh, at developing and uh, I, I i i think that uh, the discussion of emulation there also is going to be important so there's like it is on the one hand the fact that the others are this criterion but on the other hand also the fact that the others are the model or how you en enact the how you enact the, the 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 hexes properly so that uh we are going to be looking at that uh kind of like like hoping that by doing similar things we're going to get to be like them uh and uh, and that the, the the thing that we are experiencing is is is, uh, is relevantly similar to the thing that they that the experience that we're having and the, and the pleasures that we're having and the ways in which we're engaging with the activity is relevantly similar to the ones that that that, that they're doing yeah yeah that's very interesting thank you okay thank you so we have time for one more question, and there were no questions uh, today from the viewers on Facebook. Uh, I, I remember Roberto had uh, one more observation, Roberto. Am I mistaken? No, it was more like uh, insisting on a point to see it more clearly. Like when I said that it seemed to me that for Aristotle, it's very important that there is some moral importance of uh, in the transformation for him to this transformation, this specific type of transformation to become something worth investigating, okay? Uh, and you were saying, no, we, we were trying to give examples of acquisition of, of uh, hexes that are not necessarily, uh, they don't necessarily have this sort of moral importance that was uh, hinting at. And then I, I, my doubt is, isn't it the case that for sort of any sort of intellectual hexes, like it, it being a flute player, for example, isn't it something that has some moral relevance because exactly because it, you are developing your own nature. And uh, this doubt that I have in my mind, it's I think connected with another doubt that I had. And it's you were talking about it twice and then you left this uh, uh, the thing about uh, becoming a, par a parent being a hexes for Aristotle and I'm not sure I understand it uh, probably I should read that paper you were referring to and see the text uh, but it seemed to me that becoming a, par a parent for Aristotle is something like being wealthy and good and having good health in the sense that it's like a circumstances of life that is necessary to achieve full happiness but is not what full happiness is and the way i was understanding it was making sense for me because okay if it's just uh reproduction is something that any animal is doing so uh, in order to be an hexes must be something that is specifically human and for sort of the specifically human part of becoming a parent is uh like being wealthy and being healthy that is a uh, collateral and necessary but not essential aspect of being uh having eudaimonia and it's not just if i remember it correctly it's not just being a parent but having good children so if you don't have good children it can actually be uh, something detrimental for your happiness or if you don't, if you have good children, you lose them. It's not exactly an element of happiness for us. So it's, I, I was wondering whether this is a good example of this thing. And to me, it's sort of connected with this idea that, yeah, if it's relevant, it must be some development that is moral in the sense that it's exactly that it's a full achieve, full expression of your potential as a, human being. If it's not, well, it's like becoming a vampire or a wine taster or developing a taste for sports cars. It's neither good or bad. It just happens like 
uh, getting tanned when you are standing in the sun. So it's nothing more than that for Aristotle, it seems to me. Yeah, so we, I don't want uh, becoming a parent to be similar to becoming a vampire for Aristotle either. And, uh, and uh, like I kind of like walking backwards from that kind of goal that, 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 is, that I don't think it should be similar. Um, like in the passage that I didn't read from the generation of animals, like Aristotle it makes us this analogy between like animals parenting and humans parenting and about how uh, kind of like a, there is this uh, that nature makes us uh, like have these feelings of care for the young and that they express in different ways. So like, uh, and also they, they, they have different levels of length. Um, and, uh, and in the case of uh, humans, we do care for our offspring uh, all the way until they are, all the way until they are grown up and we care about their success. And as you're saying, um, and, and as you're saying, like uh, having good children uh, is, um, is characterized as a good for Aristotle. Well, having bad children is a bad thing. So like, a, like a, and then there is the way in which Sophia, well, I, 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 I cannot adjust this to what Sophia Connell does in the paper, uh, but one of the things that is relevant to the question that, uh, uh, that, 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 that um, about whether we can consider becoming a parent as a, similar to a hexes or even a hexes um is uh that like the the understanding it's relevant for how we understand the question about pose like becoming a, pa a parent it is about uh, 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 uh becoming the kind of person that is like nurturing of the youth so like in a way he doesn't like a Con sophia connell makes a parallel between parenting and being nurturing of the youth and like being a benefactor and uh, so that like, there is a continu like, there's a continuity between those 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 features or those or those uh, the activities that those things involve in a way that uh, kind of like a, there is a good and bad ways of doing it and that um, like doing it well is something that is going to contribute to our own good um and and um, it's going to contribute to our own good you say instrumentally well instrumentally if you understand that becoming a parent is just like popping out children but uh, uh kind of like a non-instrumentally but intrinsically if you understand becoming a parent as a engaging in the activity of taking care of others for their own sake and caring for their well-being and becoming a benefactor that is kind of like an activity in itself so like that wouldn't be just like a instrumental, but it would be like an activity that constitutes a daimonia in itself. And like a, not, in a, in, not, not, in a, not in a kind of like a means end way, but, uh, but rather as a constitutive uh, element. So um, yeah, like that, that is the, I mean, there's no place where Aristotle explicitly says that becoming a parent or parenthood is a hexes, but uh, the way in which he talks about how people uh, care about their about the offspring and how we do have these kind of like natural seeds to care about our offspring and that then we develop we are able to develop them well and that has as a consequence the developing of like the good children um is is is, is in line with the way in which he would talk about uh, in which he would talk about uh, the acquisition of a hexes in a way um and a hexes in which like the 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 the, the the product is external, like it will be in the case of a techne, and yet, like the success of becoming a parent is having good children. The same way that the success of being a good teacher is having, like a like a students that have learned, like a teaching center, like a, like getting the student. Like the product is external, but nonetheless, like a like a, there's a way of like like succeeding at the activity that is going to be constitutive of your own good as that thing, um, and. Uh, in relation to your first question about uh, whether it has to be moral, if you understand moral in the way in which you're putting it, then I'm on board with moral. But uh, I was kind of like demoralizing the moral in the sense that uh, it does contribute to some good. But now, like uh, the good in Aristotle is is not kind of like a, is not moral in the way in which like, we understand moral in modern ethics, in the sense that uh, uh, becoming a becoming a, a playing the flute or uh, learning math 
um, it does have like a, like in so far it contributes to the development of our capacities and contributes to our like the becoming who we are and developing our own nature is going to contribute to our good. Uh, it does it's like different from and it's not directly uh, kind of like a consider under the umbrella of kind of like what normally is considered the moral virtues. So it's be like when I said not moral is because I wanted to include these other virtues like the intellectual virtues but also development of other capacities in general that uh, that that are kind of like part of the well functioning of a human. And as such in line of what you're saying they are in so far they're part of what the well functioning of a the human they're connected to our good and our happiness, and uh, and in that sense, they they can they could be called moral, but it's like moral in the broad sense, not like in the narrow sense that we typically understand moral. Yeah, it is interesting though that yeah, sorry. No, 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 please. No, I was just I'm just reiterating. It's it would, it's interesting though that we're in all these cases that Aristotle's interested in, we're interested in developing capacities that are good for us, right? There in some in some respect, whether it's being healthy, whether it's being wise, whether it's being morally good, it, we're developing capacities that are good for us in some respect. And all these other cases of transformation, you know, it's there in some sense, we're, he's not very interested in that. Or maybe they happen. Maybe when Priam becomes less happy, he doesn't lose his virtue, but, you know, he, he loses Hector, he loses his city, he becomes less happy. Maybe that's a transformation, but it's not one that we understand um, as like philosophically. Well, it is philosophically significant. I don't know. I have to think more about that. Well, but that at the same time, that is like a good route in order to kind of like a start like a division of the example. So like that that consideration about whether it's something that contributes to our, our good, like as a human good, is something that uh, that uh, kind of like a, would be a good way of dividing the kinds of examples that we're getting from the contemporary discussions. So that things like becoming a vampire are going to be off the picture because uh, because they cannot be considered as like as part of that, uh, and then I mean like in order to just like handle that properly, we would have to just like think about like becoming a god. But maybe insofar there is at least part of us that is divine, we can just like make some claim about the fact that we do have a sense of what it is to be like the god. Uh, I don't know. That's too much. I gotta leave it there. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think I, I understand your concern with moral, not using moral and uh, it makes sense. To me. I mean, it, I was thinking that probably for our soul it would be something more with a moral uh, dimension, but I guess it's good not to use it uh, because it can create more confusion than... But we, I don't know if there is time just for, for the parenthood Thing. Yes, we do. I so, mean, if you're okay. Would it be correct to say that there is nothing specifically about parenthood in, in, in that axis? Because it's the value of that axis, you say, is being a benefactor and a good educator. So it's nothing really specifically related to parenthood. It's the same thing that can happen to someone who is not the parent of the children he's teaching. and. I mean, what is there in the experience of parenthood? At least if I understood your reply correctly, it's something that is not specifically related to parenthood. It's, it's related to being a benefactor, being a good educator, and so on. So again, I'm not really convinced that framing it as becoming a parent is really what's doing the job, but I mean, I can... Well, like, I mean, like, a, like a, a way of approaching that and like i'm really happy that you're pushing this because like this is kind of like a last thought of just connecting the sophia connell paper with this because it was like a good like wrapping up of the of the topic and i do think that like it is very interesting the fact that she puts it as like becoming a parent and like developing a like our own good or like a, a achieving one good that is our own good now one of the things that she says there like she points out there in relation to the way in which aristotle talks about being a parent is that like being a parent is a kind of philia and it, that is a kind of philia that does come with which is a virtue and like a, or like we, which can be understood as a virtue and like this is a way in which we might be able to kind of like also understand the ways in which philia 
um, philia is taken as a virtue and a hexes in Aristotle. So, and I, or at least this kind of like a structure philia. Then, like another thing that is relevant there is the the seeds that we have. So, like the analogy with animals and the fact that we do have this kind of like innate tendency to care for our offspring that makes it so like and then we can do that well or badly so like there is something there that it also has analogies with uh, with the structure of the hexes development um, i see but with I, I don't know if i can push this part again no no yeah, but yeah, if yeah do it's it the, the philia thing then someone could say yeah but there is the philia about in business relationships as well and it's us a secondary form of philia as the uh, parenthood philia and in any case i think it's also i mean there can be some resistance about framing philia as a hexis and a uh, sort of virtue i guess uh, but i mean um, yeah, yeah so that um, and i think that that is like a, that is very inter important and interesting that it has to be some it is not evident in the way in which that is a kind of hexis or analogous to a hexis or similar to hexis um now like entering in a business relation like there might be like the, 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 i think that um uh, instead of it being an objection it can be like another example so like what it is to embark in in, in entering in business relationships you're like a, what is it to become a business person and then like a like the like if it can be if it can be put you know, if I sort of can put it or characterize it in terms of like that are analogous to developing a hexes, then we can give a similar account of like what the kind of personal transformation it is. And uh, and we would have a sense and we would like the idea is that all the things that we have said about developing a hexes would apply to this kind of transformation, becoming a business person or becoming a ruler. And what is it to become a like, and those are all kind of have like a different ways of relating to one another that Aristotle describes in the ethics. And all of them are like they're good ways of doing it, bad ways of doing it. And all of them have the similar characteristics of like they're having to be like predispositions and like preconditions of doing it right, etc. cetera. Uh, so like if they can be spelled out in similar ways, then instead of being objections, they might be just kind of like a, other example that can be developed and explained in the light of the model. And then yeah, the, th the things that cannot be explained in the light of the model are going to be, on the one hand, they becoming a vampire. And on the other hand, I think that we do have difficulties with uh, with sensation. Like I, did, like, I think that the, we would have much more to think about, like what it is to acquire a new mode of sensation because of the ways in which Aristotle himself draws the line right there. The one is talking about the difference between the difference between uh, like a different dif the capacities and hexes, like the innate capacities and hexes that we have to acquire. His paradigmatic example is the case of sense perception, and uh, as an opposing case to the things that we learn through engaging in the activity. So mm -hmm. we do not need any previous experience or there is no, trans it seems that there is no transformative experience that makes us being the kind of thing that sees. It's like the seeing itself that gets activated just by opening your eyes, for example. And uh, and in that sense, kind of like a, the transformation wouldn't be like the transfer. I, I, I think that it would, we had difficulty in, in, in spelling it out and in terms that are continuous with this com completion model uh, and yet, I think that it would have also a different role from the kinds of things that uh, the kinds of things that the replacement model is going to say, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's another, relevant, but, another case. but for Aristotle, I guess it's technically impossible to, physically impossible to have, to conceive a uh, different modality, like beyond the five senses. So I, probably it's not the type of argument that someone today want to hear, but he has an argument for that. So. But I mean, like, I don't know, and and this maybe someone in like, someone in, in in the in the screen knows about examples of acquiring acquiring a mode of sensation doesn't need to be acquiring an extra human mode of sensation. It can be someone who doesn't have it and then suddenly recuperates it. So someone who lost vision and then gets it, or someone who doesn't have vision and acquires vision. I am not familiar with there being any example, but that would be like like how he discusses that would be very helpful in order to see like uh, how he handles it in contrast with acquiring a, a hexes.
through practice. I don't There's know. There's something about losing sight in Parva Naturalia, but not about reacquiring it. Not yeah, that I know. Okay, uh, so, but even even cases of um yeah, that'd be helpful. Of, of losing sight because the part the process should be parallel. It's just like like there is the production that happens through perfection and uh, like the activity leads to perfection, but also uh, there are things that can happen to us. We can suffer some things that lead to the destruction or to the deviation from, mm -hmm. and uh, and those two things spill onto the account. We have focus here on the case of virtue because that is the one about which there is more, there is more material, but uh, also the the becoming vicious or becoming defective has to be part of what transformative the, the relevant transformative experiences are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As Daniel was insisting. Yeah. yeah, there's a mental experiment about reacquiring your sight, like the, you lose it with, with age, and then you you could reacquire it, but it would be just for a physical uh, reason. Like it's in the first book of the anime when he has this comparison between uh, noose and perception. And I don't know if it's relevant for you, but there is something about the different phenomenology of different senses. Like when you have these illusions of touching an object that is uh, one, because you see that it's one, but it's two for like your touch. This is called Aristotle illusion, I guess. I don't know if it could be like an, a, a way of uh, showing that it was aware that there is a different phenomenology for different senses. But it's, it wouldn't be something radical for him, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Thank you. So uh, since we have no more questions, I guess that is it for today. Let me thank again everybody who's here, and especially Andrew and Marta for the presentation. Very enlightening. I hope I have you all back here in the following years. Thank you. It's really nice to meet all of you. And thank you for the comments. This is extremely helpful, at least for my thinking about it. I have to go back to the drawing board with a few arguments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for the discussion and thank you for inviting us, Daniel. Yeah. Okay. See you soon again. Yeah, yeah, we will. We'll see you soon. Bye bye everybody. <laughs>